as you guys know, my fiance's name is Mallory. We've been dating for nine years now. Um, and so I've got two stories to tell you that I think you would find very funny because she finds them very funny um, and likes to give me a lot of crap for them, even though I think I was being a very responsible adult in both situations. Um, within four months of us dating, I went on a road trip to Yellowstone with two friends and we were supposed to go up to Canada as well, but you'll understand in a moment why we didn't get to Canada. Um, this trip had been planned for a little while, so she wasn't with us and, and she stayed behind. And this is like a two week trip that I'm on. We get to Yellowstone and we're supposed to be there for two days, I think it is. And uh, the first full, like we get in one night, um, kind of hang around a little bit and then and, and we camp outside um, or camp in, at a tent that night. And then the next day is like our day. We're going to go all around the park and everything and, and like see as much as we can, see Old Faithful and all that other stuff. Um, well, I did a really bad job of hydrating during that whole trip. And I don't know if either of you guys know anything about Yellowstone, but it's very high up in the air. Um, it's, I think, like 6,000 feet, something like that. Um, and so at the end of this trip, I am the only driver, mind you, on this road trip. We planned this kind of poorly. I was the only driver, and it was a stick shift car that we had. And I'm the only one who's capable of driving stick shift. Um, we are about to head the last two hours back. We saw the last thing that we wanted to see, which was... Uh, um, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, I think is what it's called. Um, and we're about to head back and I suddenly just get hit by like a whole lot of dizziness and nausea and everything. And we drive, I have to drive us back while feeling like hell, uh, to our campsite. And it's a two hour drive back around the other side of the park. Um, and eventually this leads to me having to go to the hospital, um, <laughs> has leads me to going to the hospital at like two 30 in the morning. Um, so we're in Grand Teton at this point, I think it is, where, is where the hospital is, which is like another park outside of Yellowstone. And there's no reception. This is 2015. Like cell service is even worse than it, 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 it is now. Um, but I need to like call my family and call Mallory after where I get out of the hospital after like three hours. Um, and I've gotten IVs and everything else and a chance to sleep a little bit. And I'm feeling better. And I have to explain, Hey, like I'm okay, but this is what happened. Blah, Bigfoot blah. didn't get you. Yeah. Bigfoot didn't get me no bears, nothing, but I did, you know, dehydrate myself and pass out. Um, so I, I call Mallory and it's like six 30 in the morning, local time. And I just say, Hey, like this is what happened. You probably won't be able to hear back from me for a while just because of service and everything, but I'm all right. We're just trying to figure out a way back into Yellowstone. Um, so she loves that story one because like we're barely dating and she just wakes up to a voicemail on her phone. That's like, Hey, I nearly died. How's it go? And <laughs> talk to you later. <laughs> so the, when you said you didn't hydrate, you just like didn't drink water the so, whole time. Or? So the, the Nalgene bottle that I have that you guys have seen me using here, I had a similar one, um, that I was drinking throughout the day, but this was like 10 hours that we were out at elevation, um, in a car kind of moving around too when we were getting to, to locations like walking around and stuff like that i didn't drink nearly enough and didn't realize it um like throughout the day i felt fine until the moment i didn't it was just like an instantaneous like oh i feel like crap i don't know how i'm gonna get back to the car um so i had to call her and tell her this and the, the first time that she's able to like get in touch with me after this which is like a day or two later she's kind of like what the heck is wrong with you and i'm just like i don't know i'm trying to tell you that i'm all right but i didn't die that's a you're lucky you're lucky she stayed with you jake well it gets so it gets better after this the second story that i have to say is it's also related to vacation the first trip that she and i ever took was to toronto um see drake to not see drake <laughs> to see everything but drake um the you know we worked together at the carlisle sentinel so like being able to take vacation time was not something we could do very often we would take like weekend trips together when uh the sports coverage was slow and whatnot, but we wouldn't really be able to go anywhere. So Toronto for like five days was the first time we got a chance to go anywhere together, work less, you know, disappear for a couple of days. Um, we go up into the, uh, the space needle tower there, um, CN tower, which is right by the, the, uh, blue Jays ballpark. It's right by the aquarium that they have there. It's really, really cool place. If you, neither of you guys have been there. Um, but to go up in the space needle, like you have to pay to go up, but you can also go up and pay for, for dinner. So, we decided to make a night of it. We go and pay for, for dinner there. And, and when you go up, you can, if you come back down, you cannot like go back up there for free. You have to pay again to go back up. Um, so after dinner, we, we decided to go walk around like the, the viewing space that's underneath the restaurant that's at the top of the tower and just kind of look, cause we hadn't really seen much. And I've been here before, but she hasn't. Um, 
it turns out she started having like her feet started to hurt her with the the heels that she was wearing so you know she didn't get she decided to kind of call it pretty early and, and i was like all right well just go sit back by the elevator and i'll i'll come find you in a minute i just want to walk around a little bit and see you know just do do a lap around and she's like okay so i do that and like five or so minutes later i go to walk back up to the elevator mallory's not there and i'm like okay well she couldn't have gone very far because there's like 20 steps between where we split up and where the elevator is. It's, it's kind of difficult. So I start walking around trying to find her again. Like there's only like so many people here. It's an isolated place and it's not like she can disappear all that much. Um, now mind you, we don't have cell service there because it's Canada. We, we don't have anything. Um, so I'm trying to find her, trying to find her and like 20, 30 minutes goes by and I, I cannot find her. I'm staying by the elevator for 10 minutes. I'm telling the, the person at the desk that's like, Hey, did you see this brunette woman? Like the most, generic description I could possibly give because that's all I can really describe her. She's brunette. She's like five, eight. That's so remarkable. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm sure she'll love that description. <laughs> it's, but there's like, there's no like defining features that I could say. Like she's got a streak of purple hair or she's got like, you know, she tattoos on her face. Yeah. Like there's nothing that I can say like, Hey, have you seen this particular one? It's like, have you seen a brunette? And they're like, sure. Yeah. We've seen a lot of brunettes <laughs> be more specific. Um, so, I, I can't figure out where she is. And finally, the only solution I have, because I'm like, I'm worried that she went down the elevator. And like, if I go to find her and she's not there, then we're both separated and we don't know what's going on. So my only solution is I realize I have Wi-Fi. So I go into Facebook DMs and I message my mom. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, Mallory has uh, enough signal because she because she had signal in Canada with her self plan. I did not. So I was like, can you text her and ask her where she is? And so she's like, what the hell is going on? And I'm just like, long story, but we lost each other in the CN Tower. And she starts crackling. And finally, she gets back in touch with me. And she says, Mallory says she's where you left her. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I've walked by this spot four times. How have I not seen her? And I go find her. I was like, you were supposed to be at the elevator. She's like, no, I said I was going to wait right here. I was like, no. So we got a little confused. And she's like, she's arguing with me about it. But now she loves to... Any chance she gets, she loves to bring that story up to people. Like we're we're going through wedding planning and everything, and um, our uh, officiants like you know asking for anecdotes and stories and stuff like that. Um, he, and he's one of my best friends. Um, and so we were telling him this story, and she like she loves to tell the story her way because she's she wants to make me seem like even more the bad guy when I'm like, yeah, but I figured out a solution to find you. Like look at how into look at how creative I was. <laughs> look at what I did to figure out where you were. <laughs> You've heard of I left my heart in San Francisco. <laughs> I left my girlfriend in Toronto. <laughs> for the record, I've been saying, just, just to loop back here to the Drake comment, I've been saying for years that Drake should be the halftime show of the Super Bowl. They put Kendrick Lamar up there. I'm not watching that. I, I, I am boycotting the Super Bowl halftime show. I'm sure Roger Goodell is so disappointed <laughs> that Brandon Howe is not watching that Super Bowl. Even if the, even if the Steelers are in it, you're not going to watch it? That's how that's how Brendan feels I, I'm about not the Super Bowl. I'm, Lamar. Just, I'm not boycotting the whole Super Bowl, just the halftime show. I'll, I'll go outside and listen to Drake on Spotify. Maybe they can bring in Paul Simon. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Butler County Chamber of Commerce. Sprinkles Neighborhood Market. Robert Stevens Custom Jewelers. R.W. McDonald & Sons Incorporated. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting Eye on Sports. Welcome to Alter Eagles Eye on Sports podcast. My name is Derek Pida. I'm a sports writer for the Butler Eagle, and I'm joined today by Brendan Howe, a fellow sports writer for me uh, with us here, and Jake Adams, the Butler Eagle sports editor. Uh, guys, this past uh, week, Weather played havoc on high school football, not just in Butler County. but Just a little bit. Just a little bit. All over the place, all over the region. Uh, some games were some games were played on Friday. Others were uh, postponed until Saturday, and uh, while others were completely canceled, and uh, there's a chance that might not get made up. But uh, one game that was uh, originally scheduled for Friday was pushed to Saturday because of the weather it was North Catholic's game at Blackhawk. Um uh, the Trojans pick up their first win of the season, 33-32 over the Cougars. Quarterback Joey Felitsky has passed for nearly 800 yards and six touchdowns through three games for North Catholic. Uh, my question to you guys, is this offense, is this type of effort sustainable? And looking ahead of the team's schedule, do you think uh, the Trojans will make the Whitfield playoffs this year, Brennan? 
Um, I, I'm going to run with the second half of your question there with the making the playoffs. North Catholic's next two opponents this week and next week are a combined 0-5 thus far. So you figure those might be a little easier uh, wins to pick up. After that comes a bit of a gauntlet in Amoni Christian, Central Valley, uh, Beaver, Avonworth, and Hopewell. Uh, those teams are much better in terms of record, uh, and I think that stretch will be hard for the Trojans. So if they are to make the playoffs, they're going to have to carve out a few wins against really good teams. Jake, you did the uh, preview capsule and a, a feature on uh, Brady O'Hara before the season, the Penn State recruit playing tight end for the Trojans. What are your thoughts on this offense so far, and what are your thoughts on North Catholic moving forward? Um, one thing I remember them bringing up, and we were pulling up stats here before we started talking today, is uh, they did mention Christian Naylor's name, who's their, their starting running back there. And I know part of your, your topic today is, you know, what do we do, or what do we do with this offense? Um, it's interesting to me, like, I look I look at the rushing stats, I look at the passing stats, and, and Felitsky has thrown more than double the passing attempts of anyone else in 3A Whippeo. Like, that is an insane number of three games. And it'd be one thing if this was week eight, and they were just that much of a, a pass-first team, and he had pulled away that far. But through three weeks, he's already more than double anyone else. I, I got to wonder how much of that is just the way the game flow goes, because they've trailed uh, quite a bit in their first two games until week three's win. Um, so I wonder if they're just playing from behind and, and they just have to throw because Naylor's stats aren't awful. He's, he's got a 4.3 yards per carry average, which isn't uh, you know stellar at the high school level, but it's by no means bad. He, he He's getting his yards when he gets the opportunity. It just doesn't seem like there's a lot of opportunity right now. Right. Um, I would say this. I, the two question marks are, as you mentioned, Naylor's got a decent average. Um, as they go through the season and they get into their – conference schedule can Naylor run well enough can that line open up holes uh, so he can take some pressure off of that passing game because obviously it can't be all through the air and the other question I have is North Catholic's defense Um, they've given up a lot of points Uh, I don't think Blackhawk is that good of a team and um, North Catholic needed to outscore the Cougars on Saturday 12 nothing in the fourth quarter to pull out that win it was a one-point win Uh, so I do have a question about their defense. I, I think the running game is still up in the air, but I think it is a good sign regarding the passing game that uh, he is spreading the ball around Joey Felitsky. His three touchdown passes on Saturday went to three different receivers, Jack White, Will Waskowitz, and Riker Kennedy. Now, in terms of uh, the playoffs, Class 3A sends the top three teams from each conference plus three wild cards, so that's going to be 12 teams. I think in uh, in North's conference, which is the Western Hills, I think Beaver and Avonworth are clearly the two best teams in that conference. But I think, from what I can see, I think the third spot is wide open. So between that third spot and the, the three wild cards that are out there for three A teams to grab, if I had to pick right now, I would say North Catholic does make the playoffs. But I, I definitely think there's some question marks moving forward with the team. It's uh, a... I have to default to you guys quite a bit on kind of understanding where everyone kind of sits within the, the, the bigger picture here. I do remember talking to North Catholic uh, during training camp that they're thinking state playoffs. They're thinking a deep state run Um, right now. Obviously you got to sit there and like, just get one win at a time. You got, you got to pull out these wins. I had, you know, my hot take at the beginning of the year when we were doing like our bold predictions was I thought we'd have three district champions across all of our, our teams and I said North Catholic, Mars, Knock were, were three of the, the ones that could contend. Uh, that's not looking great at the moment, so I think I'm going to kind of hold back on saying anything much more. Um, so I, I have to default to you guys quite a bit on like where what this means and how what position North Catholic is in going into the rest of the season. One, one thing that I do think is interesting, um, the way the Whipple is set up now, is Brennan, you mentioned they have a game coming up against Amani Christian. That is actually a non-conference game, but the fact that at the end of the regular season, the Whippill um, selection committee is going to pick three wild cards. There's no doubt in my mind that they're going to take into account non-conference games. If North Catholic plays a Monte Christian in a few weeks and beats them, and North Catholic does not qualify for the playoffs with a guaranteed spot out of their conference by finishing in the top three, a win over a team like a Monte Christian would be a huge positive uh, and, you know, when when the people look at the other team's schedules and they say, okay, who should we pick as the wild cards? I think this year, I think non-conference games are going to play a, a huge part in who makes the playoffs as, as the wild card. It's kind of a, you know, 
look at this on our resume. We beat a team like Amani Christian. So we'll see. that that That's a huge task, though, for North Catholic because Amani Christian is a really, really good team. Amani Christian is actually in Freeport's conference. Joining us in the studio today is longtime Butler coach Mike Seibert. He's formerly the girls track and field head coach for the Golden Tornado, the current boys track and field head coach for the Tornado. He coaches distance runners for both teams, and I'm not done. He's also coaching cross country this fall. Mike, you wear many hats, but we appreciate you taking the time here uh, to join us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> now, you took over the cross country program this year after Rick Davenzotti retired. Is that correct? Yes. What was your involvement with cross country specifically before this year? Um, when I came to this um, school district, I was um, just a track and field coach. I wasn't doing any cr- cross country. Um, I stepped in 25 five years ago. I was the head coach for about 10 years for cr- cross country back before Dav stepped in and took, took over. So, um, you know, coaching the whole year long cross country indoor track and outdoor track. Uh, when I had my first son born, um, that's when I stepped away from cr- cross country to at least give six or seven months away from the coaching. So, um, and then obviously I ran for Butler whenever I was here, my senior year. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the 1970s, late 70s, early 80s? Yeah, 80. Okay. Yeah. Class of 80 you were. I was class of 80, yeah. Okay, so uh, we've got a few weeks into the season here for cross country so far. What can you tell me about the boys and girls teams? Anybody you want to point out individually? Well, on the on the boys' side, you know, losing our top two kids, Drew, Drew Griffith and Owen Dressler, um, those are – Huge shoes to fill, obviously, but we have a strong core of four boys right now that are running top top times. Zach Sleer, we have Logan Rogers, Brandon Eicher, and um, Ethan Thomas. They were strong kids on that varsity team last year. Um, right now, we're looking at who's going to be that five. Um, we have a good senior, Shea Sins, that are stepping into the number five spot, but these younger freshmen and sophomores were looking to step in. Um, on the girls' side, we're about six deep as far as immediate point point scorers. We have the top two uh, seniors coming back, Michaela McClister and Maddie McGarra. Um, they ran incredible times last year in the 19s. We have kind of a youth movement right now. We have um, uh, Macy McClister's coming back as a sophomore, and then three freshmen – Zari uh, Goliu, um, Kira Oliveras, and make sure Avery Sins, three three freshmen and sophomore. That's going to be a huge impact on our girls girls program. And and we have a lot of younger boys and girls that are coming. And we're only into our second meet here, so we'll see how their summer workouts went and how they're going to impact the team this uh, fall. I recognize a lot of those names from the track team is it pretty much a given i mean through your experience if you run distance on the track team you're going to run cross country in the fall is it is it a given like that um most of the time you know because they go hand and foot you know you normally your cross country program is going to be the feeder system for the distance um once in a while you'll get um soccer kids that don't do cross cross country but then they come and they run middle distance or long distance in the uh springtime but um you live and die with your distance program and track and field with the cr- cross country program. Now, uh, in recent years, I think uh, we're going to start here with 2018. That's the year Noah Beveridge graduated. Mm-hmm. So Noah Beveridge, and he uh, he graduated. C.J. Singleton came in. He graduated. Drew Griffith and I know they overlapped a couple of years where mm-hmm. they were on the same team. C.J. Yes. And, and Drew, but. Um, all of those had very strong careers in both track and cross country. What are your thoughts on the talent that has come through recently um, in, in both sports for the on the boys side specifically? Yeah, when when Noah's coming coming through, you know we saw that in seventh and eighth grade. He was just so far ahead of all the other runners, you know, across the Whippeal and this side of the state. So he he was already a driven athlete there. And then his his climb to stardom um, just went the whole way up through in the Whitfield in the state, and then he ends up at Syracuse University. 
Um, and you think, wow, we're never going to have a kid, kid like, like this again. And then CJ moves in and he was driven through, he came through Butler Catholic coming up and he was just self-driven to be great. And I think Noah Beveridge set the standard that CJ wanted to get above and, you know, and climb, climb up the ladder. And he really did. And then with Drew coming along, um, it's, it's a huge benefit. And Drew will say that when you're in 10th grade to be running with a senior, that's going to win the state state championship and go high and go to Notre Dame. Um, but CJ even said whenever they were interviewing him when he was breaking records, CJ was, he's like, I don't know why I'm going to get all excited. He just pointed to his left. He goes, he's just going to break them anyway. So CJ even knew that Drew was up and coming to something great. So um, those three kids, I got a picture of them all together last year. Um, and it's just amazing that we were lucky enough to have kids of that status. Um, and Drew just went off the off the charts. So um, we've been lucky to have them here. This past spring, uh, Drew Griffith ran a sub four minute mile. Yes. I mean, the first guy to ever do that, the first human to ever do that was Roger Bannister. They made a movie about it. Yeah. So what, what, when's the director going to contact you about <laughs> making a movie about Drew Griffith? Uh, <laughs> it's, it was, it was fun. And you know, um, as, as time went on and after even the school year ends, through, through the summertime, all the big wig runners, then they get to com compete, you know, nationally at the big meets and the shoe companies fly them all over the place. So over the last 30, 40 years, all the stud distance runners and, and track kids, uh, sprinters and hurdlers and so, so forth, they, they carry on. And so we got to enjoy another month and a half of Drew after the state meet. Yeah, after the state state meet. And he just kept on knocking down records. And, you know, he'd fly to um, St. St. Louis. He'd fly to Seattle. He'd be up in Boston. They they flew him. The shoe company flew him from um, the West Coast into Philadelphia for the New Balance Nationals then. You know, so it, it's – it. The scene has changed a lot over the last 20 years. The shoe companies are getting involved and they're promoting, you know, the incredible top level athletes. And I mean, it's obviously a, um, a money thing. They're trying to sell products and shoes. I talked to Drew at the state meet and I believe he told me at that point he had received like 35, 40 pairs of shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He has a pretty big closet or he should get one. Let's, let's put it that way. Yes. Yes. Um, Obviously, a guy like Drew is—he's got talent. He's—he's self-motivated, but all the guys who are teammates of his now at now at Notre Dame, including his his former Butler teammate CJ, all those guys are talented. They're all self-motivated. What is it about Drew that has allowed him to break school records, district records, state records, and national records? I mean, he has literally put himself at another level. What is it? about him that has allowed him to do that? Well, um, one thing I stated, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever Noah Beveridge was, was coming along, these kids that are top in the country, top in your state, they have the strength, the speed, they have the drive, the work ethic, they have good good coaching, they have all this stuff like that. There's like an it, it factor that not a lot of kids have. And Noah was the one of the first ones I was around that had that it factor that he was different from everyone else. He he just had to drive where he he had a zone that a lot of runners cannot get in. And then CJ the same way. And then with Drew, he had another level I didn't even know. I've never been around. He just has a visualization that he has. He told me the night before. He just goes through exactly what he wants to do, how how he wants to do it. And I've never been around a high school kid or a college athlete runner that could stay calm at all time. His, his pulse, like the whole thing I ask him, I go, do you ever get, get nervous? He goes, no. He goes, I just go through everything I want to do before I go to bed at night. And then the next day I just put it, I go through the motions. So 
he he has something special like that what what he thinks about before he runs and then during his race and um he's he's just a very calm very talented and driven athlete that but the mental approach I've never 40 years of coach I've never been around a kid that had that he so, visualizes it and then he goes yes, out and makes it happen that's yes very very calmly um you know, when you're on a kid for four years, and especially the last three years, um, you know, struggle a little bit with some injuries his freshman year, and then last three years, but he just never got worked up. He never got frazzled. He he, he was never out of his sorts, and that just normally doesn't happen. It's hard to happen. When did you notice that Drew was kind of a different animal, so to speak, when it came to competing and what he was capable of. When did you know that he, he could be something really, really special? Well, going through junior high, um, swimming was his number one sport before. And he ran, um, and you could see he had a lot of skills. His freshman year coming up, we were a very talented, loaded team. And um, he went through a little um, injury with his hip. He went to see a doctor that we recommended. He got it all straightened out. Um, and so his, his, his freshman year wasn't a normal telling point that you would think with a kid that, that good. When he came in his sophomore year, it, it wasn't just a, like a climb. It was, it was like a rocket <laughs> ship going up. If you go from being, you know, an unnoticed, you know, underdeveloped, you know, strength-wise boy in ninth grade to finish second in the state meet in cross country – you know, as a sophomore right behind CJ, well, it was obvious he was a stud. I mean, it just he just picked up once once his health was good, and then once he realized that how good he could be running, he kind of shifted from the swimming to the running scene. And he's always come – I mean, I, I've interviewed Drew a number of times. He's always come across to me as somebody – obviously he enjoys his success, but he, he's a humble kid. Is very he, humble, very humble. A, pl a pleasure to be around every single day. You uh, mentioned earlier that uh, you competed yourself at Butler. What sports did you compete in, and can you tell us who your coaches were, and is there anything that sticks out about uh, your time with them? Well, it was it was a weird way that I ended up with uh, running. I played, you know, basketball at Butler Catholic and playing baseball. You know, that was the thing to do around Butler, and um, – you know, I did I did hockey stuff with other friends, but once I got into high school, you know, playing the baseball or the basketball, I was never going to be out on a court. I was never going to be, you know, a stud baseball player. We were all there were so many good baseball players back in that day. So during my junior year, I I, I shattered, I broke my right arm really bad sliding in third, third base down Pullman Park. So I missed my junior year doing everything till the arm got better. Um, one of my best friends, who's the number one runner on the cr cross country team, Bruce, Bruce Park, he asked me to come out to run over the summertime. And I was like, I go, you don't even have a ball. <laughs> like what's, I didn't even know what cross cross country was at the time. And so I started running, found out that, you know, I had some skill there. And then working through in um, track season, you know, the speed rather than cross country, running the mile, whatever, uh, colleges noticed. Uh, I had very talented teammates that were younger than me that they were looking at, and they just noticed, well, who's who's this kid? So I got a, a nice scholarship offer to Duquesne University, which I would never have been able to afford without running. So it just ended up being my ticket to – college and the next level and then I just caught caught the the running fever I guess it's called so you know you look at a sport like football and, and anybody that knows football decades ago and and what it's like now they they know the difference in offense you know 35 years ago the spread offense was like a you know it was like kind of an experimental type thing now so many offenses including in high school are running the spread offense um what differences between track or cross country either sport 
how have, have they changed either the way it's competed in during the season or in the off season? How have they changed over the last four decades since you competed? Well, I think that, um, first of all, the internet, um, you know, back in the days, you couldn't communicate around the country or with teammates or actually just getting information at the, at your fingertips now. So, um, kids at, you know, the top level, they, they talk to each other all around the country. They tell each other what they're doing, how their workouts going, how they're feeling. There's a thing called Strava, which is online thing that you post all of your runs. They, and then you make comments about how you felt and what went on. So these guys, like the top, say, 200 runners around the country, they're all following what everyone's doing and what their coaches are having them doing. So there's no secrets anymore. So all the coaches have their fingertips on what everyone else is doing. Um, shoes is, you know, before we had a joke because you got a new pair of shoes because, you know, your parents had a little more money. It's like the old saying, it's not the shoes, it's the man in the shoes, you know. <laughs> but now it is the shoes. Um, the the technology now that they're doing on the Olympic scene, on the college scene, the high school scene, they said that, like, shoes alone are, are benefiting you like a second a lap. You know, it's just the way they're made and the way they're pushing your body, the way, you know, it's there's a shoe that's for 800 meters. There's a shoe that's run for the steeplechase for the for the longer races, and you could have a kid that's doing a workout that have three different pairs of shoes for different parts of the workout, mm-hmm. and um, until and I think the new shoes prevent <clears throat> a lot of injuries too, because there's so much cushion like the spikes they're wearing used to be you'd almost be on the ground running in spikes. Now they have spikes that have solid cushions so you can run distance races without pounding your feet. Mm -hmm. So the olden days to now, um, I think think back in the days, more was better. You run 100 miles a week, then you were better than a kid that ran 30 miles a week. So I think, you know, now that too much is, is not good. You know, so you work your athletes the right way, the proper way, and you're not overtraining them and killing them. So there's no competing in Chuck Taylors anymore. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, and when when I started, North Hills was the state state champion, and all of their kids were running hundred miles a week. Um, and then North Allegheny won the following year, and their kids were running it. And then Butler, the the third year, then Butler was the best kids. They put four kids in the top six in the, the Whippeal back in 81 and 82. And, and through that era right there, the mileage started to go back down. You know, you don't have to run 100 miles a week. So times have changed, but tech, technology now has changed the running scene. Like I can talk to college coaches or professional guys all around the country and get their opinion on things for a coming week for workouts and they can, they can put three or four insights in that can adjust what I'm doing. It makes a lot more, more sense. And I've been coaching 40 years and I was on the phone last week with two other coaches at the same time we were conferencing. And, and where were these coaches at? Um, one was in North, North Carolina and the other one's up, up in Canada. <laughs> you got to love technology. Yeah, but but their ideas, they were very successful as runners and they were very su- successful as coaches. So, you know, getting back into the cr- cross-country scene rather than just on the track doing your training, um, I wanted to get some fresh ideas into what I was doing. And it's it's kind of fun, you know, teaching old dog new tricks. 40 <laughs> years later, you think you, you think you know everything after 40 years, but there's insight of what goes on or what an athlete did that every year you learn five or six new, new things and you put it in the bank. Mike, I mentioned earlier that you uh, formerly were the head coach of Butler's girls track and field team. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, uh, John Williams is leading the girl and he, girls and he does a great job, but I yes. just wanted to get your thoughts on since you've been involved with both the boys and girls track and field teams, the tradition that comes along with both of those programs. You guys have both won multiple Whippeal titles. When a kid joins 
Butler track, whether it's boys or girls, what are they walking into there? Well, I think the big thing that we've always done with track and field is that um, we want you to do your best. Uh, there's 18 different events. That, you know, there's sprinters, there's distance runners, there's hurdlers, um, there's jumps. And just in the jumping stuff, there's different athletes and go in different directions. You can throw. And, and when you come in, we just want to see that you're putting – your best effort forth. And we never put too much pressure. I learned that in college when I was running, watching other coaches, not not my coach, but watching other coaches put way too much pressure on kids. And it's just when coaches make it not fun, then your athlete doesn't become a relaxed, natural athlete. So we tell kids to do their best, and we're really proud of them, and that's that's all you can expect. And it's, it's like a – it's a climbing thing. You know, you come in as a freshman, learn from the juniors and seniors what they're doing, listen to your coaches. You have to, you have to be, be accountable. And at the same time, we try to be flexible because to have a track team with 100 kids on one side and 100 kids on the girls' side, you have to be a little bit flexible because these kids normally have another sport. You know, if you take, you know, basketball and soccer and gymnastics and dance and all, all the different things – multitude these kids are involved in you know that maybe they need one night a week to get over to some something else so you need to be flexible enough to utilize a hundred athletes to cover 18 events so what has kept you involved in butler athletics as a coach for so many years you said you mentioned 40 the years it is now. 40 years 40 years as a head coach at butler what has kept you coming back year after year well, I think it's um, obviously everyone that coaches, it's the kids because young energy is just incredible. Um, I always had a passion to, to, to coach even whenever I was playing. I said, I would like to do that sometime. But um, the coaches that we have, um, they're some of my best friends I've had. There's, you know, six or seven that have been there over 30 years with me. So – when you're doing something with people you enjoy being around, that always helps. And um, the team thing, I think a lot of um, track and field and cr cross country is an individual thing where you're going to be a star or good yourself. But our, our program brings in the team aspect for the team points and what you're adding to the team and how you're helping each other in relay teams. Like that's the love. I like, like, if you just have one good kid, it's awesome. But when you have four kids and they're doing it together, so I think relay teams and the team competition are the, the two big things that keep me in this sport driving. And now in cross country, you can have four really good runners, um, and if your fifth runner's not, not good enough to stay up there, then instead of winning, like in the big meets, you'll be back 12, 15 places. So – it's the team aspect there again. Um, I opened the show with mentioning uh, that you are not only the head track coach for Butler's boys, but you also coach distance. Mm -hmm. And John Williams is the head coach for the Butler girls, but he's a jumping coach as well. Right. Um, talk about the the number of people that help out with the program because there's pretty much a, a coach for for the, you know there's a a distance there's a sprint coach Fred Pinto I mean right. how many people have a hand in the su success for Butler track um just on the varsity level we normally have around 9 or 10 coaches the school pays for 6 of them um and again no one coaches high school sports for the money because, like, the paychecks are not really there for, especially when you're going indoor track and outdoor track together. The money's just not there. But Fred Fred Pinto does the um, sprints. Colton Nist helps him during indoor track. Then Jeff Runwick has been coaching our hurlers for a long time. Um, Rick Davanzotti and myself have been working with the distance runners and the middle distance kids. Um, Bill Elliott now has been doing our shot and disc and Jackson Williams, which is John's um, youngest child. Jackson is the javelin um, coach. We had Jerry McGarrett for a long time coaching our pole vaulters. Um, now we have Eric Holtzel stepped in to coach the pole vaulters. And pole vault of all 18 events, that's the hardest event to get somebody who knows what they are doing the right I, way. I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. And then 
Hannah, Hannah Williams, John's daughter, like last year or two, two years ago, she was helping in the high jump so John can stay in the long and the triple jump. Um, and we've had volunteers that have come along that have stepped in and helped. Like Tyler Rowdy Bush will just, like he has another job. He'll come up to help out at the meets and practices and just volunteer his time. Um, but then we just have a whole slow, slew of um, coaches that have helped in the seventh and eighth grade level because if those eight or nine coaches down there do not help, we we don't have those kids coming up in ninth grade that are going to try track and field. So they teach them how to wear their um, their spikes at the right you know time and meets, how to hurdle, how to pole vault, how to do, you know how to throw. Um, a shot and disc and how to come out of starting blocks. So rather than just start cold Turkey with kids, when they come up to the high school, those, those coaches down there are the lifeline of our, of our program. Um, we had long time, like Mark, Mark Fairby was a long time coach, head coach and throne coach. Then Rick Shantz, um came in and followed suit with, with him. So between the, those two, shot and disc in the throws, they covered like 30 years of the throwing areas. So, I mean, to, to keep the same coaches coming back and knowing the kids and who's coming up and how they behaved the season before and how to motivate them, um, motivation is everything in high school sports, you know, because you need to make it fun. And there's nothing like getting a 16-year-old, 17-year-old athlete that's really good and then get them motivated because then they're like, Wow, I can't believe, I can't believe, it all sometimes surprises me, but I think we get more excited than the kids do sometimes because we know what they're achieving and it's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the, the spring season, the outdoor track season, I know you guys host the Butler Invite every year. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously the, the Whitfield team, which you guys always seem to be involved in, Whitfield ch team championships, the Whitfield individual championships, and then, of course, the state meet. Regarding the high school season, as a coach, at what point do you get the most riled up? I mean, obviously states is big, but you also have a lot more kids, Butler kids, competing at, say, the Butler invite. So yep. at what point would you say is the high point of your season, just as far as an emotional high? I, I think that the team playoffs, I, I think all of us, the coaches and the kids as a whole group, we get super pumped because um, – most of the kids and most of the coaches, we take this team thing very, very personal. Um, you see things that start in, in sixth grade or seventh grade, and then, you know, it moseys up. But then it, it just builds. Like like the Butler Invite, we're hosting, and this is our home. You're bringing all – when we get over 90 teams now coming in to to our home, that's pretty cool. So – but and then the state meet, it's just you're in awe that – there, there's this many great athletes across just the state of Pennsylvania. Interviews with Mike are always entertaining. Uh, he speaks obviously with experience, but with so much enthusiasm for not only the kids, but the sport itself. And I uh, can't tell you, Mike, how much we appreciate you coming in and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Good luck to you. Thanks. Welcome to Beyond Butler, the segment each week where we talk about something outside of Butler County, uh, whether that be professionally or collegiately in sports. Uh, we're staying pretty close this week uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They won their game against Atlanta. Their opener, 18-10 uh, to 10 on Sunday with Justin Fields starting as a quarterback after Russell Wilson was out with a calf injury. Uh, heading into this week, Russell Wilson is feeling better, but Mike Tomlin said in his press conference uh, today, Tuesday, that... They're preparing for Justin Fields to start. Fields went 17 for 23 uh, for 156 yards to the air uh, on Sunday. Didn't make many mistakes. Uh, led the team to victory, even though they didn't score a touchdown. Uh, Boswell, Chris Boswell, the kicker, had a really big game. Uh, Justin Fields also had 14 carries for 57 yards and only took two sacks. So my question for Derek and Jake here is, what would you do with the Steelers quarterback situation going forward? I am okay with Fields remaining the starting quarterback. I mean, you know, I – I'm a Steeler fan. I'd love to see them go out and score, you know, 35 points and put up 400 yards of offense every week. But last week, it's their first game with a new starting quarterback. It's their first game with a new offensive coordinator. Um, you know, it was wishful thinking if, if anybody thought they were going to go out and, and just be lights out on offense right off I the did. bat. <laughs> you did. Well, 
It's okay to think that way, but but in the end, they won the game. Fields, um, I will say this: they do need to find another downfield threat other than George Pickens. Oh yeah. Because um, you look at the passes he completed outside of the ones to Pickens were like five, six, seven yards. He had a one yard pass to to Van. Jefferson, I believe. I think the most impressive thing Pickens did on the day was he took that end around and he jumped over someone. He juked another person out and he got tackled for five yard loss. But that small little space there, he made like three people miss. Right. So I, I think with a, a a new quarterback in the system, I'm talking about Fields here and a new offensive coordinator. They won the game. Now you're just looking for improvements every week, and I, I would stick with Fields. Um, you know, it's not like. Russell Wilson is an established starter at Pittsburgh. It's not like he was Roethlisberger after 10 years. Yeah. And let's face it, over the last few years, it's not like Wilson's played that well either. It's, it's These are not his Seattle days, that's for sure. Jake. Yeah, he, he definitely, like, it, it, the the Steelers fan base, the, the Steelers are talking about we need to win a playoff game. They haven't done it in quite a few years. Like, this, I don't think you do this with Russell. He He's not... He's not let Russ cook anymore. He hasn't been in a while, um, and we know what he. I, I I legitimately think we know what he is. We know who they are. They are who we thought they were. Um, like Fields is at least some untapped potential. I think he was misused a lot in Chicago. I don't think Chicago is going to do all that great with Caleb Williams either, because I just don't think that coaching staff is all that particularly good. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, I think at least with Fields, you have uh, untapped potential that is a higher ceiling than than Wilson brings. And he he brings some playmaking that Wilson's legs just will not allow at this age, um, especially when you don't have the the receivers outside of Pickens to to take off some of the weight uh, around the other the rest of the offense. Like Farmer's a really good tight end, but let's let's face it, he's he's no Tony Gonzalez, he's no uh, Travis Kelsey or anything here that's gonna you know burn teams in the middle of the, the defense all the time. Um, it, Fields gives you a better shot at being multidimensional and being able to break some games open. We saw that a little bit on Sunday. Um, and I think, too, like so many of those games were so bad. Those offenses were so bad. And a lot. And speaking as an Eagles fan who watched his quarterback through two interceptions, two boneheaded interceptions, um, I think the offenses are just really far behind right now. And, and it's quite likely that Smith would – Arthur Smith is going to be able to, to make some improvements there. I'd go with Fields the rest of the I'd go with him for the entire season. So a, a few things here is I'm an Ohio State fan, as we've talked about before, and his last year at Ohio State, he threw 40 touchdowns and one interception, um, which was incredible. Uh, but aside from that, you mentioned that the offensive play has kind of gone down in the past few years in the NFL. I saw a tweet that said we it was kind of like a joke, like, we used to watch gods play quarterback and mm-hmm. someone like quote tweeted and said, Tony Romo would be top five these days, which I think is pretty funny because honestly, aside from Mahomes, you really don't see many quarterbacks that are just tearing it up anymore. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is. I would say this, that that defense has a chance to be great. With If Watt stays healthy. That's, that's, that's a big if. Yeah. And yeah, but they have a chance to be great on, on defense and I know Fields loves to run the ball, and obviously with a quarterback running the ball, there's a potential. Just try to limit the turnovers, and in his case, more fumbles than interceptions. I, I think, you know, with him running the ball as much as he likes to and as much of the he, – he's going to be counted on to, to to pick up yards with his, with his legs. Just it seemed cut that he, down on the fumbles. Don't turn the ball over. If you don't do that, I think the Steelers have a chance to have a really good year because that defense is going to be – it can be so good. I thought you were going to mention Fields' health there with running, but when he ran on Sunday, it seemed as if he knew when to go down, when to kind of give up on a play. Like, there were a few plays where he even fell down behind the line because he knew nothing was going to happen on that play. So it seems he, he's pretty smart in the manner of he's not going out there and trying to run people over, even though I heard on the broadcast that they talked to Arthur Smith and they asked, who does Justin Fields most resemble as a runner? He said Derrick Henry. I thought that was pretty crazy that – you compare Derrick Henry. I thought they were talking about Najee Harris, which kind of makes sense, but they were talking about Fields in terms of running talent and what he can do. So I thought that was pretty cool. I, I do want to throw one thing out there regarding you mentioned Chris Boswell had all their points, six field goals. I knew he was good. I've, I've watched his whole career. I've been a Steeler fan my whole life, but I did not know that going into that game, and obviously now uh, since the game was played because he didn't miss one, he's the NFL's career leader in field goal percentage of beyond 50 yards. Yeah, I did not that's know that. That's nuts. He's a robot. Yeah. It's like especially, having a cyborg garden kick. Especially with Tucker in the same division and who's largely considered like a potential future Hall of Fame kicker. Wizard of Boz. Barkles.
<laughs> and now it's time for Stump Derek. Come on, Brandon. Where's your moves? <laughs> <laughs> Elevator music. I am one and two. This is either my favorite segment of the show or my what least ruins favorite. your day. Yeah, literally. I'm, <laughs> Jake, if I get this wrong, I'm leaving. For he the walks day. out here with a frown. Um, <laughs> so, so as we know, Derek is a pro football savant. I've asked him some questions in the past week about Pittsburgh sports. This is going to be more broad reaching here. Um, this player was an offensive lineman. Who was the first player in NFL history to make a base salary of $1 million? Base salary? So his entire contract was for a $1 million. Yeah, it doesn't include signing bonus. Okay, I get a, a few minutes to think about that, right? Okay. We'll remind our viewers of the uh, question in a, in a while, but I'll have, have to think about that one. The answer is not Brendan Howe. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting out there and blogging anything. <laughs> oh, we know. Now it's time for picks. Uh, the first five games that I'm going to mention here, we're each going to give a little bit of analysis. The last six, just the straight pick. Um, Jake, Scoop, and I went six and one last week. Brendan, you went five and two. We're coming back. We're coming back. We're going to start off with the Butler Golden Tornado traveling east to face the Holidaysburg Golden Tigers. Who do you like here, Jake? It won't be golden for one of these teams. It will for the other. I think uh, Golden Tigers have a, a couple of receivers here that have had 200 yards already this season, four touchdowns each. They're like really oddly identical numbers. Um, can the Tornado defense slow them down? We've seen them be, as we've mentioned a little bit in the office, uh, a little bit more physical the last few weeks compared to previous seasons, which is a good sign. That offense seems to be clicking a little bit better, but defensively I think this is going to be their toughest test on the edges that they've had so far. If they can if they can make the plays to slow this team down or, or force a couple turnovers, that could be the difference. But I'm going to go with Holidaysburg in this one in a tight one, 30 to 24. I might regret that. Brennan, do you agree with Jake? <clears throat> Corny color word play from Drake there. Um, <laughs> you are jealous. <laughs> you wish you could think like that. <laughs> hey, so walking off the field with Coach Eric Christie on Friday night after I talked to him, after Butler's win over Meadville, 35-11, I came away genuinely impressed by what they were able to do there. I let Coach Christie know I chose against him that week. He said, oh, and shook his head. So I'm going to say something that hasn't been said much in the past, what, 20 years here? Butler's picking up steam. I'm not choosing against them again this this week. I think the running game they have, defense they have, they win this game on the road a few hours away, 34-28. Laura, I think you need a steam engine whistle going there. Oh. <laughs> Shit's a joke. <laughs> I'll find it. Producing in the back end, come on. <laughs> <laughs> This is the first time hearing about a steam engine. I'll get you a steam engine. I'm going to look for it right now. Okay, Laura, you do that. <laughs> Holidaysburg is 3-0, and but I think this is definitely going to be their biggest test to date this season, and i like Butler to go on the road and win by four, 24-20. A game of the I'll be at this week, knock at Montour. Uh, the Knights didn't play last week. They're one and one. Uh, they're going down to face a tough Spartans team. Jake, do the Knights move to two and one with this one? I think this one's going to be interesting. Uh, Cole Medilli, I believe I pronounced that name correctly, leads a, a defense that has done very well so far this season for Montour, and that team is ranked number two in Whippeal Class 4A by Trib Live. Um, Knox, not quite there yet, I think, although we have seen them look a little bit more impressive since week one. Um, but I think that that defense, at least from what I'm seeing on paper, haven't seen the team in, perfect, in person at least. I think Montour is going to come away with this one, 28-7. Brendan, will I be seeing a knock night win on Friday? You'll be seeing two vet veteran-laden teams, um, much like knock. Montour is led by a lot of seniors and juniors. Um, I think the Knights' week off will hurt. The last time I chose against knock, uh, they kind of hurt me. So I'm still choosing against them here. Montour, 21-8. to eight. All right, I... I, I do agree with what Jake said about Montour's defense. Um, from what I've seen, the, the Spartans have also struggled to score points themselves. I actually like 
uh, Knox defense to step up in this one and come up with some big plays in a low scoring affair. Knox wins 17 13. All right, guys. Well, you talk about the highest of highs going down to Florida, winning a season opener against a team from Orlando. That's what Mars did. Since then, they have not won. Uh, they lost uh, this past week. They gave up a late lead to lose to North Hills. Now now they're going to the pit to face defending state champion Aliquippa. Brendan, we're going to go to you first on this one. Do the planets upset the Quips? I'll be out there for this game. Uh, just want to mention that. And Aliquippa is probably the most storied high school setting in the side of the state. When you say that, Derek? Oh, yeah. yeah so, absolutely. with that, you, you have to go on the road there. Uh, so, I talked to some Mars kids in the preseason, and they admitted that when you play Aliquippa, there's a certain mind frame that you have to be in, and that they weren't going to be intimidated. But it, it's hard to go into a spot like that where it's full of passionate fans and be the away team. Um, the last time Mars played a standout running back, they played one this uh, week. I'll let Derek mention that. Uh, in Bethel Park, Javon Moore, he ran wild on them. Uh, I think that Al Quippa's standout running back will also be overpowering, and they win this one 40-14. to 14. Jake? It's one thing to say you're not going to be intimidated by a team going into the road game. It's another thing to say that, and then you kind of got your butts handed to you the last two weeks after a really strong start. Like That week two loss was pretty listless from what it looked like. Week three, at least they were in that game they were leading, but they blew it late. That's... Like these are two disturbing weeks in a row for for Mars, and don't want to make too much out of you know early season high school football games here. There's plenty of time to turn things around, and conference play is going to say a lot. Um, but this is this is not the momentum. If you believe in momentum, you want to be going into Aliquippa with, and right now that's what Mars is facing. I think this is going to be uh, a pretty uh, a pretty blow, a pretty much a blowout game for Aliquippa. I think Mars might get a, a late score or two. Uh, when this thing is out of reach, but I'm going 35-14 Quips. This game is actually a rematch of last year's Whitbill semifinal, won by the Quips. I believe the final score was 47-24. Um, Mars's defense, um, I, I, last week they gave up, uh, what was it, 21 points, but I think that's 21 points against a, a North Hills team that is going to rely a lot on its defense this year. I don't think North Hills is very strong on offense. Uh, and then you look at the two previous games. They did beat Boone in the first game of the year, but they gave up a lot of points. And they also gave up a lot of points and a lot of yards in the week two loss to Bethel Park. And when you're facing a running back like Tyke Hayes, um, who hurt Mars last year in that playoff game, uh, I just don't think it's a good equation. I like the uh, planets to put up some points in this game, um, but Aliquippa wins at home 38-22. All right, this this game here is uh, really interesting as far as I'm concerned. We got Freeport at Deer Lakes. Um, Deer Lakes has looked really strong through three weeks of the season. Freeport coming off a game that was postponed to Saturday. They clobbered Quaker Valley. Now they're going to uh, Russellton to face the conference foe Lancers. Jake, does Freeport uh, earn a, earn their win uh, a first win in conference play here? I think Freeport's been one of our more consistently good teams so far this season, and I think that's going to carry over uh, a good bit this week. It, it is interesting. This this Deer Lakes team, these Lancers have been really good so far. Is that enough to uh, to get a win in a series that is for for the last few years been very lopsided in Freeport's favor? I think they're like eleven and two in the last thirteen uh, meetings or something like that. Um, so I think this one's going to be a little bit tighter than years past, but I think the Jackets are going to pull this one out. I'm going 27-26 because I think this is going to be tight, and I could see it going kind of either way, so I'm going to make it a close game. Brennan, we know your love of Freeport runs deep. Do the Jackets pick up a win here? Deer Lakes actually beat Freeport, shut them out last year to ensure that Freeport couldn't make the playoffs. Final, final game of the season last year. Um I think Freeport, they have a bounce attack this year from what I've seen. I haven't gotten out to see them. Derek was supposed to get out to see them, wasn't able to. Uh, I think that bounce attack comes up big, and Freeport wins 26-20. This is a very tough game for me to pick because uh, Freeport's got that running game going with Amos Glenn. He actually also returned a kick 91 yards for a touchdown this past week. I think it's Quaker Valley. Um, but Deer Lakes, I, I think the difference in this game is their quarterback – Jake Fleischer is very mobile, and I think that's going to be the difference in a game. I think it's going to be uh, a really good, entertaining uh, contest 
but I think Deer Lakes is going to win by 8-32-24. All right, the last game that we're actually going to analyze is Dubois area coming to Carn City. Carn City had a game last week against St. Mary's, which was uh, postponed. We don't know if it's going to be made up, uh, but now the Carn City Gremlins uh, getting ready to host the Dubois area Beavers after a week off. Um, Jake, who do you like here? Can't use the excuse of or the the analysis of uh, Carn City getting to play its first league game. It's one of the few teams in the area that's already been in league play. Uh, to start the season, but I think this is going to be their strongest test so far in league play. Du Bois looked really good uh, early on this season. Still think Kansas City or Kansas City, Carn City, with this run game, definitely not the kind of offense that Kansas City runs. With this run game and how dominant that offensive line has been the the first couple weeks of the season. Grant and they had a week off. Maybe they're they're going to be a little bit more rested, or or maybe they're going to be a little rusty. I'm not entirely sure. I think Carn City's offense though, it's just going to be too much to handle in this one. 35 21. I'm going. Brendan, Carn City or Dubois? I think Patrick Mahomes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think Hunter Scherer and the rest of those running backs uh, getting some rest will help them out. I know that the week off, I said, will hurt knock earlier in this, uh, but it's two different offenses here. So Carn City's ground game uh, is healthy, so watch out, Beavers. Carn City wins 35 How many running yard, or rushing yards does Isaiah Pacheco get for Carn City this week, Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> Carn City, um, the last time... We heard of them was the last game I, I covered of them. They, they had this past week off because of the weather against St. Mary's. The week before that, they just ran over Brookville. Um, they looked really good. I think Dubois is going to pose a, a bigger test than Brookville, but, man, they've looked really good so far, the Gremlins, and I just can't pick against them right now. Jump. Yeah, that's it. The train's coming through. <laughs> Train's coming through, and Carn City's going to roll to another win. They're going to move to 3-0 with a 35-30 win over Dubois area. But I think this is going to be a really good game, really good. All right, we're going to go to uh, just the, the picks on these ones. Uh, no analysis. Seneca Valley at Norwin. Jake, who you like? I'm going to go with the uh, fiancé's alma mater, Norwin, 28-14. Brennan. Norwin, 28-13. It's a sweep. I'm picking the Knights 25-17. Quaker Valley at North Catholic. Jake, who do you like? North Catholic is going to go to two straight wins with a 30-14 victory. Brennan. Trojans, 28-14. I'm picking North Catholic, 30-7. to Summit Academy visiting Hookstown in western Beaver County against Southside. Um, Jake, who do you like? Southside, 28-19. Brennan. Southside, 45-15. Boy, that's very close to my score. I got Southside winning 44 to 16. Did you see those Carn City scores that we picked? All of us 35 to something. <laughs> We're on the same page this week. I don't like this. No, I don't like it either. I don't want to be associated with you guys. <laughs> Central Clarion at Monata. You talk about a stiff test for the Warriors. Um, I mean, Central Clarion, obviously a, a favorite to win D9 class double A. JQ, do you like? Central Clarion 42 to 6. Brendan. Central Clarion fifty to twelve. Central Clarion forty two to twelve. Kane coming to Rymersburg to face the Union AC Valley Falcon Knights. Brendan, we're gonna go you first on this one. Union AC Valley thirty eight thirteen. Jake. I'm going Falcon Knights twenty nine ten. I'm going the Falcon Knights in a blowout thirty seven to eight. Slippery Rock. This is a rivalry game, one o'clock at Forker Field in Grove City on Saturday. Slippery Rock traveling in to face the Eagles. Who do you like, Jake? We will actually have someone at this game. First coverage of Slippery Rock this season. Grove City, though, is going to win this one 35 to 7. Brendan. Grove City 28 to 20. Grove City 27 to 7. We are we're thinking alike right now, and I don't know what to do with this. That's not the point of picks. Hey. See, we gotta, we gotta catch up against him. We gotta well, pass to well, him. I'm, I, I'm tied with him right now, and I'm I'm just waiting for him to you know have a three and six week, which is probably going to happen. So sure, I'm I'm pulling up the rear right now. All right, uh, we got uh, the trivia answer here. Remind our viewers of what the question is. My question for Derek was, who was the first NFL player to make a base salary of one million dollars? Offensive lineman, Hall of Fame offensive lineman, obviously. Yeah, I, I'm going to go Russ Grimm. 
Bruce Matthews. Russ Grimm uh, grew up about eight miles from where I grew up, but Brandon, apparently it's a it was a bad answer. So if Derek resigns at the end of today because of you, <laughs> just know that this is because of you. <laughs> you have one job now. <laughs> Make sure he stays. <laughs> It's okay. I'll take them out to get hot dogs at Sam's Club and all will be okay. Better pay. (laughs) (laughs) Our final discussion topic. uh, Butler. Brennan, you covered Butler last week. You saw firsthand that blowout win at Meadville. Um, I'm going to go to you first on this one. What are your thoughts on Butler's 2-1 and start to the season? And uh, in your opinion, what players are most responsible for this uh, early surge for the Golden Tornado? So the thing that stood out the most to me or that has stood out the most to me early this season uh, is kind of highlighted by one play uh, early in the game against Meadville. This is before all the rain, before all the bad weather came. Um, It's fourth and eight from the 31-yard line, from Meadville's 31-yard line on the first series of the game. Past years, Butler would have punted maybe. Meadville would have went down and scored, and then it would have been downhill from there. The confidence just kind of rolls away. But instead, Christy... Coach Christie sends Alec Teff out there. They go for it. He hits a wide receiver for 15, 16, 17 yards. They score two plays later, and boom, the confidence just skyrockets. So uh, that combined with I'm writing a feature about him. I went out and talked to him yesterday uh, at the Golden Tornadoes practice. Uh, running back Mark Clems, he's a junior. That ground game compared or er, that ground game uh, with Alec Teff's passing prowess. That offense is really playing well. And then the defense, I think, has allowed 20 points or less in each game. I, I could be wrong depending on what the Shaler score was. I'm, no, they, I'm they lost that game 20-14. to 14. Yeah, so th- they've allowed less than 20 points in each game. They've played in each of the first three uh, weeks here. So it's just a combined group effort for the Golden Tornado at this point where the confidence is starting to build, and that could be a really good thing for this program. Jake, what blows you away by the Tornado? <laughs> I see what you did there. Um, I – uh, one shout out to Brennan's story coming out on Clemens uh, on Thursday is is a good one. Um, so everyone check out butlereagle.com dot slash sports uh, to to read about that or get the paper. Um, I I think you know again you guys are, are the ones out there on the ground seeing this stuff. You, you definitely see more than me, but from what I I'm, I'm able to pick up from conversations with you guys, from seeing the from reading the stories, editing the stories, and everything, it, it's a team that's playing with confidence right now, uh, and that's pretty clear since we. Two, like early on in week two, they, they they got some points on the board finally at the end of week one. It wasn't enough to come back and win that game, but now they're 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 rolling. And if, if you know what Brendan's saying is true here, that they they go for on fourth down in a situation where in years past they wouldn't, um, you know, I think that speaks volumes. Coaches saying, I you know I trust you, go out and win this game, go out and win it early in this way. Um, Brendan, I, I want to ask you, like we were talking about this last night a little bit. Um, when you were playing on the team, you remember situations similar to that where it's like, okay, we c- we're either going to punt it and, and it feels like the game kind of gets lost in that moment or uh, you know, maybe if we would actually try to go for this, what might happen? So like, can you take us inside a little bit of like your, your head uh, in those years of when you'd be in situations like that? What was that like to have a fourth set down situation where it's punt and lose, where you felt like it was punt and lose the game? So I actually went back last night, as I told you, and looked through all of the – First three game stats since 2016. So that covers my brother's time playing there. He, he finished up in 2018. My time playing there, my final season of 2016. And just seeing the scores that we endured and we had to suffer through was amazing to me, especially compared to how this team is playing now. Um, I think fourth down in years past when I was playing, there wasn't a question. You were punting the ball. Like mm-hmm. the way I describe my time playing football for Butler to people who aren't familiar is going into a game, I always felt as if – we thought this, 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 and this had to go right for us to even have a chance to win. Mm-hmm. So you're going in as the underdog every game, and you know that if something goes wrong early on, that the confidence just completely wavers. So that's not what this team is doing. They they think, Coach Christie told me on Friday night as we walked off the field, I didn't use this quote in the story because it was kind of off the record. If they beat Holidaysburg, he thinks that's a program-changing win. He thinks at that point – this team and this program will start to get back on its feet and see what it can do. Well, and even Clemson kind of intimated that a little bit in the story that you have coming out is like they they have this one circled. This is this is an important week for them. It's a long road trip, and it, Holidaysburg always seems to have a solid team. So if they can go out there and beat the Golden Tigers, it would definitely be. Um, you know, not that Butler's already kind of on a roll, but it would be a huge boost for them, and I think it would be um, a the. 
I think for both of those teams, Butler and Holidaysburg, this is the stiffest test up to this point that they will have faced. So, um, obviously, good luck to the Golden Tornado toward uh, making it three straight wins. I, I, If you guys remember our opening podcast at Butler High School, one of the guys we had on stage, one of the players was Leland Anderson. Mm-hmm. And um, Eric Christie, the head coach, told me he's definitely the leader on the line, uh, offense and defense. But I talked to John Enrietto, the former editor here. He covered Butler's first two games. And he said – uh, Butler is playing more physical now than they have in years. And when you make a comment like that, it's not just Leland Anderson on, on the offensive line. It's everybody up front, you know, winning the trenches battle. And I think a lot of credit goes to not only Leland, but his teammates up front because that's where it starts. I know it's cliche, but it's it's said all the time because it's true. Uh, on the offense, if you're pushing people around, it's so much easier to gain yards. On defense, if you're getting penetration, it's so much easier to keep teams from gaining yards. And I think uh, the guys up front, led by Leland, but everybody involved is is uh, doing a good job. And, Bre- Brandon, you mentioned some of their skill guys. They're making use of those holes and those opportunities on offense. I uh, I wonder, though, I've seen some of the comments on, on some of the coverage that we've had. Is this a product of – the schedule that they're playing or is this legitimately like a changing program of a program that is evolving now? I think, and I've also talked to coach Chris about this beating Brashear two weeks ago. My brother was there in attendance. John was covering the game. They said there were 25 players on the team total. And you look at Butler who has 50 somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I think exactly that's what, I think that's what Christy said in week one. It, for, it, it, it was at least podcast. double what Brashear had. And what stuck out to me was you beat Brashear, big deal. And I even said that in our picks last year. I said, or or last week, I said, oh, well. Meadville had the same amount of kids as Butler did. They weren't as big, but Meadville does have a traditionally solid rushing attack and defense. And the fact that Butler went out there against a team that was evenly matched with them in numbers, that's kind of what stood out to me was they went out and dominated a team that was of the same sort of size as they were. I think uh, we, we also have to remember last year, Butler played a pretty similar schedule to what they got this year, right? And what was their record last year? Two and seven? Two and eight. Two and eight. Okay, so I, I think it, some of it comes down to the fact that they're playing teams that are have smaller rosters, but there's obviously improvement in that program there because last year it was um, – for the most part, a, a very similar schedule, and they won two games. They've already got two wins after three games, so I, I think it's there's definitely improvement with the tornado, and uh, you know we'll see how things work out this week, Friday out in Holidaysburg. It's actually all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank our sponsors: R.W. McDonald's and Sons Incorporated, Butler County Chamber of Commerce, Robert Stevens Jewelers, Sprankles Neighborhood Market. And we would like you to we would like to encourage you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and the Alter Eagle podcast and Butler Eagle News. Uh, subscribe to the Butler Eagle YouTube channel and we will talk to you next week.